In this video we're going to take a look at some of the challenges from the Seesaw 2021 CTF. This is the qualifying round running from the 10th to the 12th of September and then we've got the finals on the 12th to the 14th of November. So let's go and take a look at some of the challenges. We'll start off with this warm-up category and the first challenge is called Poem Collection. It says, hey I made a cool website which shows off my favourite poems. Can you find flag.txt somewhere? And we have this URL to go and visit so we'll take a look at that. So we arrive at this page which says go check out my awesome poem selector and then we have this link to the poems directory so let's open that up and immediately we see this warning file get contents file name cannot be empty and we have the path to the index.php file you can see the error is on line 4 and we've got three poems here that we can select let's try and open up poem 1 and that opens up we can see that our URL is now set to this query so we have this query and then we have this value let's try poem 2 and poem 3. So we might want to go ahead and just see if there's any other poems which aren't linked here. What if we try poem 4 and we get nothing? So that failed to open this file, there is no such file. Uh, if we go back to our challenge description, it says see if you can find flag.txt somewhere. So if we've got a file inclusion vulnerability here, we might be able to just say flag.txt. In that case it failed to open. But what if flag.txt isn't on this directory? Maybe it's on the next directory up. So let's try and do dot dot slash and this time we get this flag local file inclusion for the win. So that's our first challenge done. The next challenge is called crack me and the description says can you crack this? Your hash is and it gives us a hash and it tells us that the salt is the encryption method of the hash. So if the hash is of the word example you would need to submit flag example to score points and then we have an update here which I'd already solved it before this update came through, but this is basically just clarifying how we need to specify the hash. Uh, sorry, how we need to specify the salt for the hash. So we basically need to crack this hash anyway. Let's go and have a look with hash ID, or you can use like hash analyzer or something and if you just Google it. You can then just get a list of some potential hashes. It's given snefru256 is the most likely, although note that sha256 is a far more common hash type. Essentially what I did here was I created a hash file and tried to use John initially, John the Ripper, to crack this. So if you specify a word list as a user share word list rock you and then pass in the hash, it'll actually tell us that the let me minimize this. It'll actually tell us that the most likely hash type is Ghost and then it gives us some other possibilities. So I ran through this and tried some of these different possibilities in John, but we need to specify the salt as well. So we would need to specify it like something like ghost and then or have uh, ghost at the end. Uh, I also tried that, um, but we we then need to specify a dynamic format which will deal with the salt. Um, I'm not going to go through all that because it didn't work for me, but essentially after failing to crack the hash for a while I moved over to Hashcat. If we go to Hashcat we can have a look at some example hashes on the Hashcat website and in here we've got some different formats. So essentially what I did here was go and have a look for salt and if we start going through we'll quickly find that we have the SHA-256 and it can have some different formats. We can pass it in as pass.salt or salt.pass and then uh, some, some others available available here as well and this is the mode that we would need to run it on so what I'm going to do is swap over to Hashcat on my main uh, PC just so I can use the GPU and we'll try and crack it using some of these uh, some of these modes okay so what we have here is we have a hashes file which we can have a look at here hashes hashes.txt and you can see that I've put in the hash and then we've put in a colon with the SHA-256 there as well now I'm just going to copy in our hashcat command and I tried a couple here in fact let's try first of all the uh, 1410 was the first option and we're just running it with rock U again um, 1410 was basically this the, there we go pass dot salt so we run that, we get exhausted, it doesn't find anything, but if we try it again and do 1420, which instead of pass.salt, it should be salt.pass, I believe. 
yeah, salt.pass, you can see there, and it very quickly cracks that as cat house. So our hash type was SHA256, and the word that was hashed was cat house. So we can just go back and submit flag cat house, and that's the challenge solved. The next challenge is called password checker, and the description says Charlie forgot his password to log into his office portal. Help him find it. And it tells us that the challenge is written for a person on your team who has never solved a binary exploitation challenge before. Welcome to Ponin. So we've got a file to download, which is going to be our binary to test locally. And once we get it working, we'll connect to the server, the Netcat server here on port 5000. So with that downloaded, let's go and take a look at it. We want to make it executable first of all. We might want to have a look just to see if there's any interesting strings in here. Maybe we've got a password or something to enter. In this case, I can't see anything sticking out. Let's try and just run ltrace password checker. Try and put in a password, hello. And we'll see that it's comparing hello to password. So let's go back and run that again and try and put in password. And this time we get you got in, you got in. But that's not, um, we've not done any kind of binary exploitation there, right? So if we take this netcat um, command, try and connect to the server and just put in the same password, we're going to get the same thing you got in. If we put in an incorrect password, we're going to get that's not the password. But whether we put in the correct password or not, there's no route to us getting a flag there. So we're going to want to go and have a look at the binary. We could um, check the binary protections as well. Let's do check sec file password checker. And this will just tell us what protections are enabled. So we don't have pi enabled. So every time the program loads, it's going to have predictable addresses for the functions and things like that. You can see it's starting at this address. We have nx enabled, which means if we are able to inject some shellcode onto the stack, it won't be executable. We have no canaries, so we don't need to worry about tripping off canaries if we do have to overflow a buffer. In the case that there were canaries there, we might need to leak the canary and then overwrite the canary with the correct value if it's a buffer overflow challenge. And then partial railroad, which is just to do with the writeability of the global offset table and stuff, but probably not too much um, use for us here. Let's go ahead and create a new Geardra project and go and have a look at the assembly and decompiled code. I'll just speed through this process, it takes a little while. And with this all loaded, let's go and have a look at the functions available to us. Immediately we notice this backdoor function, but let's go to our main function which we know is going to execute first. It's going to execute, it's going to call this password checker, so we'll double click on that to take a look at that as well. And let's have a look through some of the code here. We can see that we have some variables declared here. We've got a buffer of 48 bytes and another one of 60. We have this local C variable and it's asking us to enter in a password. Our password is going to be stored in this local 48 variable, which we can see is 60 bytes. And then it's going to do a string copy. It's going to copy our 60 bytes into this 48 byte buffer. So we can instantly see that we've got a buffer overflow uh, potentially there. And next we have this local A8 which is set to this value. Let's go and have a look to see if we can convert that to... Uh, so you can see the char showing up there is draw sap which reversed is password. So this is where it's doing the comparison. So it's comparing what we enter which is right here where was our local 78 which is where our local 48 was copied to is comparing that with local 88 which is password and then if it's correct it's going to say you got in if it's not it's going to say this is not the password but as we know that's not much use to us we need to get to this backdoor function which is going to get a shell for us uh, bin sh and looking at the main and the password checker there's no logical route to get to that pass uh, to get to that backdoor function. It's never called at any point. So we need to try and overflow the buffer and overwrite the return address with the address of that backdoor function. So whenever it gets down here and tries to return to where it was before, which is the main method, 
the main function, it's going to instead see that the return address is set to this address right here, backdoor, which we can see, we can just go and grab this address here, and um, it'll then get us a shell. So let's go and test this out. We can go and let's go and run this in GDB first of all. In fact, just before we do that, let's um, let me do Python 2-C and let's just print a times say 80. Let's run the program again. Enter in this password. You'll see you'll see that we get this is not the password, and we also get this segmentation fault. So the program's crashed because we've put in an invalid address. It's four one four one four one four one or A's, which isn't a valid memory address. So we've got this segmentation fault. So we could do that. And if we let's go and try and take off a few, you see that worked fine. So we can see that it's somewhere around here that it's actually uh, we're actually overflowing the the buffer. Let's open this up. GDB pwn debug and a password checker. So we could use GDB or many other tools to have a look at the code as well if you don't feel like opening up IDA. So we can have a look in here and see info functions. We can see we've got a different functions here. We've got this back door and we've got the address of it as well which is useful. We know that the addresses are going to stay the same so on the server these are all going to be hard-coded addresses as well. Uh, and if we wanted to have a look at any of those, we can like disassemble, say, password checker, and we can go and have a look at the assembly code of that. Uh, we can generate a cyclic pattern here anyway. Let's go and test out this buffer overflow. So I'm going to generate cyclic 100. I'm going to take a copy of that cyclic pattern. I'm going to run the program, and instead of entering a password, I'm going to paste in that cyclic pattern. We're going to get a crash here, and essentially what I want to do what we want to do is have a look and see where it crashes. So because it's a 64-bit application, we don't see the um, the characters here in the instruction pointer because it's an invalid address. It won't even try to execute it. So we want to take the first four bytes from the RSP. These are the bytes which would have made it into the RIP if it was a, or the EIP if it was a 32-bit application. And then we can do cyclic-l to look up the offset and we'll see that the offset is actually 72 which would make sense because we know that we have 60 bytes here you know so there's going to be a bit of um, space so let's go and have a look at the Pwn Tools script for this um, we could grab the backdoor address here let's do disassemble backdoor and we can grab this address and go and enter this into the Pwn Tools script or we can do it another way let's open this up and take a look uh, most of this script is kind of just a template to make it easy to swap between debugging and remote and local and set up a GDB script and stuff like that. So the only thing you really need to do if you if you use this template which I have on GitHub is insert the correct binary name in here and then just go and start working on the exploit. So we know that the offset is 72. We've calculated that manually, although you can write a function here to calculate that automatically, which I often do as well that's also in the template and essentially we're going to start the application we're going to send off a payload in this case let's go and send oops let's go and send this um, we'll send the actual hard-coded address so we can just paste this in here because we're using flat and we've defined the architecture here so we've used context.binary and this is basically going to look at this binary and work out is it 64-bit is it Linux um, is it little endian format and then whenever we use things like flat, it'll take care of um, flattening for us. Let me highlight that so we can explain it a little bit better. Uh, so it flattens the argument into a string. And um, it's based on the context that we have already set up. So that means I can I don't need to actually specify this as a 64-bit address. I can just remove those zeros, and this will still know that it's a 64-bit address that we're dealing with. So let's go back and just try and run that and see if it works. It runs. You can see we've got... Um, debug mode on here rather than setting it to info or warning so we can actually see what's being sent and what's being received and um, it's essentially overflowed the buffer with these A's and then it's injected this address you can see here 401172 that's our backdoor address and that's caused it to launch the shell so now we're able to 
run commands. So we can go ahead and just run this straight on the server now. If I, because I'm using that template, I can just do Python new, and now we just add remote, and we can just paste in the server and the port number. Paste that in, run it, and now we can just get straight into the server, print out the flag.txt, and there we go. Uh, we could do this some other ways as well. Let me go back to the... So originally I had this set to elf.symbols.backdoor because because we've um, defined the binary here, it knows what functions are available. So as long as this function address is hard-coded, we can just reference it by name. Um, and that'll work fine for us as well. So if we run that again against the server, you see we've still got a shell. We can still print out flag.txt. And that's the challenge solved. The next challenge is called Checker. It's a warm-up challenge and the description says, what's up with all these zeros and ones? Where are my letters and numbers? We've got this checker.py file to download. So let's go and take a look at it. It says it's a reversing challenge here as well. So we'll copy this over from our downloads folder. And let's open it up in Codium. And we have this main method, there's a flag, redacted. So obviously they had a flag in here and then they've run the encode function. And then this is the result of the encode function. So we want to try and decode it and see what the initial flag was. So let me just take this out because that's just there to let us know what, what happened. Also this print statement is not really important either. And we have just the print encoded. So what I initially tried to do here, because we have these functions up, down, left, right, I was kind of hoping we might just be able to simply reverse it. So I didn't before even really looking at what these functions did, I simply tried to reverse the order of these. So we know the last thing that's that occurs here is this left function. So we could make that the first thing that occurs when decoding. And let's take in, it's gonna take in encoded. This one's gonna be called decode. And then the next thing was a down operation, so that's right here. And then before that we had a right operation, which is right here. And then before that we had our up operation. So we can just try and swap these around and see if this works. Let's try and do decoded equals decode encoded. And let's print that out. We don't need to print out this encoded one. So if we try and run this, Python checker, we have a typo. Let's try it again. Okay, so that prints that out. We've got this long binary string. So we could take this to Cyberchef or ASCII to hex.com or something and try and convert it. So let's go to from binary. And although this didn't give us a result, it kind of looked to me like it should be a binary result as well. So if we go to substitute and try and just swap the tick and the B to a zero and a one, and then convert that from binary. But unfortunately we don't get anything. We could try and swap these around as well. Still don't get anything. Um, so what I also tried to do again before even looking at what these functions were doing here was because we have up, down, left, right, I was kind of thinking of just reversing the order of those. So let's start off with a down on encoded and then instead of a right, we'll do, a, we'll do the left. And then instead of down, we'll do the up. And then finally, instead of left, we'll do the right. So we could try that. We'll get another binary string here. Let's go and paste it in. Nothing there, let me... Okay, so quite similar, but we don't get any recognizable text anyway. So we wanna try and work out what's actually going on with these functions. So let's go through these one by one. We've got our up function, which is doing a shift left here. It's actually convert into binary and then doing the shift left. We have, uh, well, let's go in the order that they occur. So then we have the right, which is occurring. And right is basically gonna take, so it's taking in our, at this point, a binary value because it's returned from up. 
and it's going to say it wants to take from D onwards. So this is basically grabbing like a substring splice in it. So it's going to take from the 24th bit onwards. So uh, everything after the first three bytes, and it's going to put those to the beginning of the string and then it's going to put the first three bytes at the end. So it's basically moving the first three bytes to the end. And then we have a down function. Down is going to inverse the bits, so it's going to, anything that's a zero, it's going to set to one, otherwise it'll be a one and it's going to set it to a zero, so it's just doing an inverse. And then left is basically doing the same as right, so it's calling right, but it's passing in X and D, so it's, it's basically doing the opposite way around it's going to pass in the length of the string minus d and that's going to be d in this case so if you had a 50 character string it would take 26 onwards and then move those to the and then move those to the back or move those to the front uh, rather it's uh, a little confusing all right and then um we have the, it's also then reversing that as well. So unlike the right function, which just returns X, this is actually going to reverse the bits as well. So to try and make this a little bit clearer what was actually going on and to help identify exactly what was happening in some of these functions, I actually created just, well, I duplicated this script and let's open this up, working.py. Essentially just added some comments here into the encoding section and we just run a basic test with ABCD Where we're going to try and encode ABCD and we're just going to see what happens as it goes through So we have our initial binary for ABCD and then we're going to print out what happens after we call up Which is the shift left what happens after we call right which was going to move the first three bytes to the end or the last three bytes to the front should I say um, and what's going to happen when we call down which is going to inverse the binary and then what's going to happen when we call left which is going to be essentially the same as right but reversing it as well uh, and in doing that let's run through python working and we can see then the results of these so this is our shift left and we could go and verify this as well we could go to let me clear this recipe let's put in here abcd and we can do shift left convert it to binary and this value here is going to be the same as we have here after the shift left so you can see instead of 011 which would we would have for A we have 110 which is what we have here and um, we have our three zeros at the end instead of two zeros the next thing that would happen then would be the right where we would move some of those in fact, let me let me copy over here some of my notes. I went through this solving this manually to try and make a bit more sense of it. So let me copy over some of the notes here. So essentially, this is what the functions were doing. We were doing the shift left. We're reversing the bytes. We are swapping the first three bytes with the remaining, so that chunk of three bytes, and then the same with. Uh, left but we're also reversing we have our initial value ABCD we do the shift left so this is just all the same values that we have right here we do the shift left then we do the swap the three byte block so you can see here if we take this let me just as an example just go through that so if we were to the we have our shifted left value and then we have what is going to be the value after the up occurs sorry after the right occurs which is going to be swapping the three bytes so we can take this same value here and we're just going to essentially move this to the front and then the result that we have these are the same two results right here so we know that we've got the correct result. Now we're on to the next part, which is the inverse. So we can take a copy of this and we can just have a look to see if these are the inverse, which they are. So you can see one zero, one zero, zero one, zero one, one zero. You'll never get the same two bits there. They're always inversed. And then finally we have our swapping the last uh, block and then resetting as well. So what I'll actually do here is just copy over the example that I did earlier manually and 
this is exactly the what we've just been through there. So we have our initial value. We undo the. Uh, sorry, this is going in the reverse order. So if we were trying to reverse our A B C D encoded value here, we have our result, which is right here. And first, we would undo the reverse. So we're just reversing these the opposite way around. We can do that again in uh, CyberChef. Just clear this recipe. We could do here reverse and that will give us the same value that we have here. Let me just copy that over just so you can see it. So that's just the complete reverse string and next we need to move the last byte to the front which is just what we were doing here as well. We inverse the bits which is our down operation and then we're going to do the undo the right which is going to be swapping the first three byte block with the remaining bytes and then we'll do the shift left but in this in this case we'll need to shift it right to go um, to get it back to the original value and we basically get back to our original value here if we go and convert that to uh, from binary we get our a b c d again so <laughs> at this point I did actually try to uh, basically just code that to decode the um, the encoded flag for whatever reason I did I kept running into some problems and I ended up just going through and going through the same process of solving it manually here so let's take a look at that so let's just grab the little template that we have here to perform this manually and we'll go and grab the encoded flag first thing we need to do is undo the reverse because we know that the very final thing that happens when we're encoding is this left operation and the very final part of the left operation is to reverse the array so let's go and take this to CyberChef we can go and reverse it and get our reverse string that is step one done next we need to move the first three bytes let's take this right here move those to the end and then we need to inverse the bits which is going to swap the zeros and ones let's go back to CyberChef again you can do this in um, you can write a script to do this or you can do this with like find and replace in Sublime or Notepad or something as well we want to substitute then our 0 and 1 with 1 and 0 or the other way around it's fine and that's the inverse done now we want to move the last three bytes to the front okay so let me take this now move those to the front and then finally we have a shift but if we go to CyberChef and let's do from binary and we have our flag flag reversing warm-up so I've just updated the script based on the solution we did there so if you don't want to do the painfully slow manual reversing um, let's say this was something where you needed a reusable script or something like that uh, one thing we could do for the decode is just to reverse it in this way so here we take in our encoded value and we're going to reverse it because we know that's the first thing we need to do is reverse and then we're calling this right operation but instead of doing the doing it we're doing it the other way around we're taking the last three and putting it to the front and then putting the last the first three to the end in opposite orders if that makes sense uh, and then we're going to inverse the bits just as usual and then yeah we do that other operation there that'll basically give us everything apart from the sh it still needs to be shifted so if we run python working.py we get this value here and we can just take that to CyberChef and then we can just do the shift bit shift right and that'll get us the same flag uh, I think manually at least it kind of forces you to understand it a little bit better than the script where sometimes with the script you can see I mean the way I started off by doing this was basically just reversing the order of the function calls and um, you know if you play around with that a little bit you could probably just kind of fluke it but um, that's how I solved it anyway let's move on to the next challenge 
The next challenge is called Weak Password. It's a MISC challenge and the description says, Can you crack Aaron's password hash? He seems to like simple passwords. I'm sure he'll use his name and his birthday in it. And then it gives us a hint saying that Aaron writes important dates in this format, so the year, the month and the day, rather than uh, the year, the month and the day separated by dashes or rather than day, month, year, etc. And once we crack the password, we need to put it in the middle of the flag. So the flag format. So let's take a copy of this hash first of all and it looks like an MD5 hash but we could go ahead and put it into hash ID and see some possible hashes. Let's just assume it's MD5 as that's the most likely possibility and we want to go and try and crack this so let me open up a link which I used whenever I was solving this initially. So there's a post on the Hashcat forum asking basically how to do this. How can we create a password rule that will go through the days and the months and if we go and have a look here here's a specific example where they actually have an example here for the name the day the month and the year and they're using these custom character sets so we want to we want exactly this really we want Aaron and then we want the year the month and the day so we just want to reverse this bit around so this is the mask that we'd want to use and um, I basically just took this and reversed it a little bit so let's jump over to Windows where we've got Hashcat running and we'll try this out. So we're over at the Windows system and here's the full command so we've got Hashcat we're running it on mode 0 for MD5 and then we have our hash which is just I've just pasted the MD5 hash into this text file and then we have these custom character sets. So we have our first character set, our second, our third and our fourth and these were just taken directly from that Hashcat site and then we have the mask here so essentially we want to try and crack a password that starts with Aaron and then we're going to try and just loop through the different possibilities for the date and you can see here that we have three, we have four, we have two, we have one and they're telling them which character sets to use here we could just use decimal but just just to speed it up a little bit and if we run the if we run hashcat it'll crack that very very quickly and we get this password Aaron 1980 the 3rd 21st. So the 21st of March 1980 was his date of birth and then obviously his name is Aaron so we just take this wrap it up in the flag and we can submit that. Uh, yeah so that's that's that challenge solved. The next challenge is called Lazy Leaks. It's a forensics challenge and the description says someone at the company was supposedly using an unsecured communication channel a dump of the company communications was created to find any sensitive information leaks. See if you can find anything suspicious or concerning. And we have this file lazyleaks.pcap, so we'll take a look at that. And we'll just uh, open it up straight away with Wireshark. And the first thing I did here was essentially go and have a look at the protocol hierarchy. So typically when I'm opening a pcap, I'll always do this. I'll just go and have a look at the file properties, get an idea how big the file is, how many packets, how long it was elapsed, what the date was that it was captured, etc. And then go and have a look at the protocol hierarchy to see what kind of data we're looking at here. I immediately thought SSH isn't going to be much use to us unless we need to extract a key from somewhere. But we have this telnet, um, which is 7.4% of the packets. Let's select that and we can see we have our data here so we can go through and immediately if we go through and actually start looking at this we'll see some information in the packets if we want to try and put this all together we can just right click on one of them and say we want to follow the conversation uh, TCP stream sorry and right here we see that we've got this password flag too lazy for security and that's our challenge solved the next challenge is called Mick or Mike it's a forensics challenge and the description says my Epson inkjet printer is mysteriously printing blank pages is it trying to tell me something so we've got the scan.pdf file to download so we'll take a look at that I'm going to save it to the local directory so we can go and run some tools on it as well let's go and move that from downloads to the desktop oops and if we just search PDF and hit tab here we've got a lot of different uh, commands that we can run, so we can run like uh, PDF ID. We might want to have a look at the EXIF data as well. We can run EXIF tool scan.pdf. Don't see anything particularly interesting in there. 
I don't see anything particularly interesting there either as well. Let's um, go and open up the PDF and see does it look interesting. Now this took a while for me. If you go through each of these pages they all look blank. I was trying to kind of highlight stuff. Sometimes you have just hidden text on them. But it took me a while to actually notice that these there's little tiny yellow dots here. I don't know whether you'll be able to see them in the video. But there is little tiny yellow dots kind of going around in patterns. And if we go and Google here yellow dots printer code we'll quickly find this machine identification code which the challenge is called MIC or Mike so that makes sense and it tells us that it is also known as printer steganography yellow dots tracking dots or secret dots is a digital watermark which certain color laser printers and copiers leave on every single printed page allowing for identification of the device on which the document was printed etc so um, we can go and read up a little bit more information about that. We know that we're dealing with an Epson inkjet printer, so we can go and try and find some specific information for that. How can we decode this, etc. I did actually find that there was a previous write-up of a similar challenge. You can see here NSA whistleblower, a PDF file, and what they used here, they used PDF top PM to convert to PNG images so that data can data can uh, read them which can read data encoded using these dots so let's go and open that up and if we do something similar here uh, hopefully we'll be able to extract this so we need to, we can install this with pip so I'm going to go and activate my python 3 virtual environment I'll do pip install data and we know that we need to something else that I'd already tried by the way this PDF so if we go we can do other things here PDF parser scan.pdf which will actually go through and parse each page um, but yeah uh, let's let's do the let's do this decoding let me go back and we'll do something very similar here PDF top PM let me close that down and we want to pass in scan.pdf and then what do we want to call it so we can call it anything here do we need to specify what was it PNG there as well okay so we'll specify the PNG format that's gonna run and you can see it's creating all these different PNG files for us and let's go back what do they do next so then they use data pass print and basically run that on each of the PNG images which is something similar here let's go back and do data pass print and then we'll do the first image it runs through it grabs these dots which would have, which are a lot more a lot easier to see now in the terminal and then we have our timestamp we have our serial number you can see our serial here is 102 so in this case these were decimal values which needed to be converted into ASCII which they did on Cyberchef so maybe we can do something similar you can use something else as well ASCII to hex.com for example sometimes a little bit quicker I find Cyberchef can be quite uh, uh, intensive on your PC um, so the first one was 102 so we might want to go in here and enter 102 convert it from decimal and see does that match an ASCII value it does it's F so if we were to go and try this again with the second image and we've got 108 let's go and have a look at that we've got L so I think you can see where this is going we do the third one 97 which is we is A and do the fourth one is 103 so 97, 103, and you can see here we've got flags. So essentially we just need to keep going through and doing this. The best way to do this really would be to, I guess, write a script which is just going to loop through all of these PNGs and extract the serial number. Maybe you could even convert, write a script to convert this to ASCII as well and make it a reusable script. But I didn't do that in this case anyway. I'm not going to go through the rest of the images, but if you go through the rest of the images, that will retrieve the full flag. And that's our challenge solved. 
The next challenge is called Contact Us. It's a forensics challenge and the description says Veronica sent a message to a client via the website's Contact Us page. Can you find the message? And here we have a PCAP to download called contactus.pcap and then we've got this SSL key file as well. So I'm going to download the PCAP and open that first of all. And as usual we might want to go and have a look at the file properties. We can see here it's 1 minute and 25 seconds the PCAP. It's got 3,642 packets. We can go and have a look at the protocol hierarchy and we'll see that most of the stuff here is encrypted. Um, so we've got TLS here. If we go and just scroll through the packets we'll see that as well. So we can see our key exchange at the beginning and then basically all of the data here is encrypted. So if we go and try and follow this we can have a look at the TCP or TLS stream. Uh, but it's not actually going to give. A, we're not actually going to be able to read the data at the moment. But we were given that SSL file, so let's see if we can use this. Let's download that. I'm going to save that to our downloads. We'll just go to preferences here in Wireshark and into protocols, and let's go to straight down to TLS which we want to try and decrypt using the SSL file we were given. should probably try and have a look at that SSL file as well. Let me just show you what's in there. So you can see here we basically have these secrets. Um, we can import these directly into Wireshark. So right here we have our pre-master secret log file. So if I just go browse, open it up from the downloads and hit OK and then you'll instantly see that all of those encrypted uh, things we've seen before are basically gone. So the first thing I tried to do here was then try to change this to HTTP. If we change it to HTTP and try and see what uh, has been decrypted here. We can also go to File Export Objects and we can just go ahead and export the HTTP objects see if there's anything of use in here. But if we go back to our description we'll see that the description says we're looking for the contact us page. Let's go back there again to our HTTP traffic and we'll actually see that we have the contact.submit form down here so we could go and have a look at that in the HTTP stream. So I did actually go through and try to URL decode some of these requests and see if there was a flag or any useful information in there but there didn't seem to be. Let's clear that out of the way again and we could filter by protocol again. Let's go up to our statistics, protocol hierarchy. Now that this is de decrypted we can actually see a lot more information. Um, one of which is this JavaScript object notation. Let's apply that as a filter and select it. And here we have this data jo JavaScript object notation. Let's try and follow it as a HTTP2 stream. And that doesn't look too useful. Let me go back go back to JSON. We have another stream down here. And if we have a look at this one, this one has a site key in it, okay. But still no flag. Let's try that again. Let's go and have a look at the next one. This might be part of the same stream actually. It's not, no, okay. There we go. So this one has the flag marshmallows in it. So actually whenever I was solving this initially I didn't solve it by going through the protocol hierarchy. I was I was kind of just scrolling through here and it happened to be one of the first things that I noticed which is quite um, surprising considering the amount of packets that are here. Uh, but that's how I solved this challenge anyway. The next challenge is called the Magic Modbus. It's an ICS or Industrial Control System challenge and the description says climb on the magic mod bus and see if you can find some of the messages being passed around. So we've got a PCAP to open up here. Let's download that and take a look. Actually I'm also gonna let me save that to a local directory. And again we might want to just go and have a look at the file properties. It's a 30 second PCAP, there's 228 packets in it. We can go and have a look at the protocol hierarchy and see that it's all Modbus packets, so there's nothing really to do there. Uh, let's see, can we apply as a filter? We can't. Let's follow the TCP stream. And this doesn't look much use. I can't see any ways to convert that to a flag. But 
if we go and just start looking through some of the packets and see what we've actually got in the data you'll see here we have this register one uin which is the first thing that I noticed I noticed that it was 108 and as we go through them there's one that's 97 which is a in ASCII uh, we've got 102 so it looked to me like these were ASCII values they were all in the ASCII range so essentially I went through this uh, I went through to extract these so what we could do as well we could um, apply this as a column and then we can go and actually just have a look at um, where is the column oh it didn't apply it as a column this register value let's apply that as a column and you can see here, so we could actually go and have a look at these and just go and verify that they're all in the right range and all looking correct. Obviously we're going to need them in the correct order, but we can see here if we right click this as well, we'll see that the it's the modbus.regval underscore uint 16. So what I'm going to do is extract those values with Tshark instead. So we can go here and say Tshark-r, we'll pass in the modbus.pcap, do dash t fields and the field we want is modbus.regfal uint16 let's try and run that you can see it's extracting these values which is looking pretty good let's send that to a file we'll open up the file and we might want to replace uh, backslash r backslash n with a space no, it's just backslash n here maybe. Yeah. Place that with a space and let's replace spaces greater than one with a single space. Okay. And that's looking better. So if we're going to take this to Cyberchef, just paste this in here and we'll say convert this from decimal. and you can see that we've got some strings here it looks like we've got part of our flag but it's not looking easily decipherable we can see here it, the keyword answers um, so if we go back to our pcap and go and have a look at these let's just go by the packet capture number if we were in fact let me also say um, modbus oops modbus.regval uint16 so we can just filter this and say we only want to look at packets which have this value in them and if we do that we'll see that we have some different sources and some different destinations so we could go back here and run this again but this time say that as well as extracting that we want to make sure that ip.dest equals and we have 238.0.0.1 238.0.0.1 we can send that to our file again, let's reload it let's do the same replace again, replace backslash n with a space we've got our values here, I'm not sure why this box is at the top of my uh, sublime but um let's go and paste that in we get ok bus do your stuff so it wasn't that one and I basically went through and did this um, repeatedly if we do it with three as well let's see what that gives us reload that let's do the same replace and it says if you keep asking questions you'll keep getting answers so it's not that one either and I think the final one then is the point 0.5 so we've done point 0.1, point 0.3 if you go back and do 0.5 reload do that same replace new lines and you can do that in Cyberchef as well though and there we go we get our flag Miss Frizzle would be so proud and that's that challenge solved the next challenge is called a pain in the back net it's a ICS challenge and the description says attaches a packet capture taken from a building management network one of the analog sensors reported values way outside of its normal operating range can you determine the object name of this analog sensor so we need to find a sensor in this pcap which 
um, which is reporting anomalous values basically and we're told that we only have two attempts because there's a limited number of sensors in the PCAB so let's open this up and let's also just go over to Google and quickly search for BACnet and get an idea of what it is um, so what is a BACnet system? It's a standard that specifies a common communication protocol that allows building systems to communicate with each other using a common language by implementing a BACnet system systems made by different companies can communicate with each other so we can go and um, just have a look at some basic questions and info about this but I'm going to jump straight over to the PCAB even without understanding too much about it or anything about it let's go and see if we can work out what these values are let me just take out this HID data as well I have this set up for the previous challenge looking at keyboard data but um, we'll go in and have a look we could have a look at the file properties the protocol hierarchy in this case it's a hundred percent backnet packets I guess um, so let's just go and start scrolling through these and have a look and see what properties we have if we do that we'll find that we have we have here a present value let's, let's scroll through these and see if these change at all try and make this a bit clearer um, so essentially I just went through here to try and work out what the value was that it was actually talking about let's see if we can find it we have this present value real which looks pretty good let's keep going through so it's only coming up in a few packets we've got it there again so what we might want to do is go and set this to be a column if we apply that as a column then we'll just be able to go and scroll through the PCAP and have a look and see what these values are what we can also do now as well is quite easily see what the value what the key value uh, thing is here so that we can go and filter so if I do now uh, backup dot uh, value was it oh, what was it dot present value and then we'll select this real and this will just mean that if we filter this way all of the values that we see here will have this present value so we could go through here and just try and work out what's um, what doesn't look normal and if we do that let's filter by let's do it in ascending order so it starts off at about 6.7 it works its way up to uh, 1604 so pretty much all the values are within that range and then we have these four here which are 99999 which is way outside the range of the other values so let's um, we might want to try we need to try and find out what sensor this is referring to so we could go here and follow the UDP stream thing is if we do that it's going to show us the whole UDP stream with all of the sensors so let me actually go back and just find out so we're at packet 1803 so let's just close this off let's filter normal 1803 and we could basically go through here and try and find out what is the sensor that it's referring to let me see if I can actually just see it here um, so somewhere there's going to be the name uh, there it is object name sensor 12345 so we could also apply this as a column and that would make it even easier to go through and work out um, the values but essentially this was it so if we take this value sensor underscore 12345 and submit that as the flag that will get us the the points. The next challenge is called Ninja. It's a web challenge and the description says hey guys come check out this website I made to test my ninja coding skills. So we've got this URL to visit. The title of the challenge is called Ninja which rhymes with ginger which uh, is a hint for this challenge. If we go here anyway without maybe guessing from the title we might want to try and enter some things in here. We could try and enter an apostrophe. We could try and enter some commands to see if we have like command injection and things like that which we don't so let's try and see if we can run some ginger commands let me go to the a cheat sheet here this is actually um, there's plenty of cheat sheets out here for server side template injection and here let's go to basic injection so first we want to see do we actually have execution so let's take a copy of this let's go and submit that there and we get the result that we should so we get the 777s seven, seven, we could go back and try that again with something else let's do 7 times 7 and we should get 49 
and we do. So we know that we have execution there. So what we might want to do here is have a look at the config.items. Let's go and submit that as well. And we run into this problem. The problem is, sorry, the following keywords are not allowed and we're not allowed to use underscores, we're not allowed to use config, we're not allowed to use OS, run command or base. If we go back to our cheat sheet here, we'll see that they're actually used quite a lot. You can see the underscores are used here. We can see that base is used. Um, if we're actually going to try and read a flag or something like that, quite often you'll see that OS is used here to import OS, uh, as you can see here. Uh, so we're not going to be able to do any of that stuff. Let's go straight down to the filter bypass then to see what we might be able to do here. So we can use backslash xf5 to represent the underscores. That'll bypass that part. And um, this is telling us how to bypass most filters. It's telling us how to bypass base, MRO, join, the underscore. Uh, but if we take a copy of this and go and submit that, let's see what this is actually trying to do first of all. So it's trying to open, it's going to import OS and then it's going to use process open and then it's going to call ID and then read it. But if we submit that, we're going to run into the same problem because it's, it's using OS. So we would need to take this OS bit out. And if we do that, Oh, we're still still something else in there that's not allowed. Maybe it's the run command. Um, so I didn't actually solve this. A teammate solved this challenge. So let me go to the command that was used to solve it, and we'll take a look at this. So we have here globals built in. It's just directly calling open flag.txt and read. And if we submit that, we get back our flag, flag, mummy see I'm a real ninja. So that was just a server-side template injection with ginger and um, some filter bypasses that were needed. The next challenge is called No Pass Needed. It's a web challenge and the description says it's all about who you know and I know admin. And we've just got this web address to visit so let's go and take a look at it. We've got a login form here, and so we might want to just try immediately and log in with admin admin or admin password, something like that. We can go and have a look at the post request in Burp Suite and see uh, was there anything interesting here. We can see that there was a cookie set, connect.sid, so we might want to go and try and URL decode that and see what that's um, if that's referencing anything in interesting. We could go and try a basic SQL injection here, so we could go and say or uh, 1 equals 1, something like that. Uh, try the same sort of thing and put comments in there. What I actually did here, I was working on some other challenges and I just threw this into SQL map. If we do SQL map dash R to take in a request and we can just copy and paste this request. Let's go and do subble dot new new dot request. I'm going to paste this request in here and then we could just uh, pass that into SQL map. Um, and just I just went through all the default options, but um, that's one thing to try. I also um, tried just throwing in a word list of SQL login bypass strings. So we can take a copy of this. We could go into our burp suite. We could send this to the intruder, and we can go and say that we want to. I think battering ram will will um, put the same value in the username and the password so we could either loop through username admin and then just change the password or we could try and change both so if we go into the payloads here paste that oh not paste that in um, paste these in yeah paste those in uh, we might want to take some of these out so let's just start straight off here and then we can just start the attack this will quickly start running quite slowly uh, because of the throttling. So because this is a particularly long list of 796 values, but we can see here then, if we have a look at our requests, each time it's sending the same value in the username and the password field. And we might just want to go and have a look and see, do we get a different length response? Do we get a different response code? Maybe 200 instead of 302. Um, or we could try and grep for successful login or for flag or something like that in our response. To do that we could just go into um, options, you see here grep match, so we might want to clear this and add in here flag and then it'll just basically 
let me go back to the attack any responses that have the word flag in will then come up with a tick on them so we can filter it that way um, so this is a couple of things that I just had running in the background while I was working on other challenges but uh, this didn't solve it for me actually it was a teammate who solved this challenge so I'll just go through um, the steps that they took to solve it so the challenge name no pass needed kinda hints that we need to focus on the username field although it could mean that you know we need to inject the right SQL query into the password field in order to bypass the password check but in this case um, it's the username field we want to focus on so if we enter here uh, or let's do so we could try some different uh, I've closed down that SQL cheat sheet but we could try some different values in here uh, depending on the version of SQL that's running on the server and any validation but if we try to log in with this you'll notice that it's removed everything after the space let's try and put in here hello test and log in and you'll see it's again it's removed everything after that space so let's try and put in hello plus test and in that case it didn't remove the everything after the space so um, this is essentially how my teammate solved it let's go to the query that they used if we enter or and then one semicolon let me just copy this because we're going to need it again but if we try to log in it's going to remove everything after the or but if we try this again and replace the space with a plus and log in this time we get the flag here's your flag who needed a password anyway or who needs a password anyway so we don't need to enter anything at all into the password field here in order to bypass the authentication the final challenge we're going to take a look at is called alien math it's a pwn challenge and the description says brush off your flurb garpal textbooks so we've got a service to connect to once we get things working locally so we'll download this local binary to start off with this is the only pwn challenge that we solved we didn't solve any of the reversing challenges and to be honest I probably wouldn't have solved this alien math on my own but let's go and take a look at the solution anyway so let's start by moving our file from the downloads directory to the desktop and make it executable we might want to have a look at the security protections that are enabled on the binary so we can do checksec file alien math and we'll find that pi is disabled again so the memory addresses of functions and things like that are going to be predictable so it'll be the same on the server we don't need to worry about that changing we have NX enabled so if we're able to inject any shellcode it won't be executable we have no stack canaries we don't need to worry about tripping those off if we have a buffer overflow to exploit and partial rel row is just to do with the writability of the global offset table and stuff so with that out of the way let's just try and run the program see what we get it asks us what is the square root of Zopnol, so let's just try and enter a value. We could try entering a couple of different values and see do we get anything interesting. We don't seem to. Let's try and run Ltrace and do the same again, one, two, three, just to see if we're getting an actual comparison here that we can see, but there's no string compare. We have this rand function which is being called and we have the output here, 6b, 8b, 4, 5, 6, 7. We might want to try that again and let's put in some, a different value and see if we get anything different and we'll see that the memory address here which is given to rand is different but the output is exactly the same which is interesting but uh, let's let's open up Geardra and go and have a look at the code before we go any further I'm going to open this up and create a new project I'll just speed through it a little bit Okay, and with Geardra open, let's go and take a look at the functions that we have here. And before we even click on the main function, see that we have a print flag function right below it. And the print flag function is going to open flag.txt. It's basically going to give us, print out the flag for us. So this is going to be our goal, is to get to this function. But let's try and trace the logical flow of the program. Here we've got our main function where we're going to start off. We have some variables declared in this buffer of 36 bytes. And we uh, it asks us for the square root which is what we just saw there it's calling the rand function and it's going to do a comparison then with the input that we provide so we have this local 14 which we're going to enter it's going to compare that with local 10 which is retrieved from ivar so that's this rand function and we know that the rand function is coming back with the same value each time 
So before we go through any further of the code, let's just go and grab this hex value. I'm going to take this over to you take it to Cyberchef or something and ask you to hex. And I'm just going to paste this in here and we'll get the decimal value of this and see if we can enter it. So if I try to run the program again, let's do it with Ltrace so we can see what's going on in the background. Let's enter in that decimal value because we know that a round value isn't changing. And you'll see that it did get through that stage. So we got correct and now we get onto the next part of the question where it's calling get char and it's asking us for whatever question this is. So just try and put in ABC. It's checking string length and it came back invalid input. So it looks like we need to first enter a string of the correct length before it's going to go any further. So let's go and take a look at the code again. So we've made it through the first question. This was the second question that we were asked here. And we can see that it's actually going to uh, pass our input to the second question function. So let's go and take a look at that. And in here we have some variables declared. We have a loop which is running uh, repeatedly and we have some values which are placed in here 38 running down through to 28 we can go in and have a look at these and see do these uh, convert to anything so we could go and have a look at them in characters or we could convert them to decimals or something like that and this might be something that we want to try and submit as our as our, as our second question. So you can see here it's doing the string length that we just saw and then it's doing the strn compare so this will compare n number of characters and so obviously we want to try and make our input match what we have here. So if we were doing that we could go and convert these to, let me actually go and take these to ASCII to hex again. I'm going to take this whole string of hex values and just try and see what it is in decimal and can we just enter that in again so here's the oh that's not the decimal the decimal value is going to be too big for us to convert we could try this text value here let me just let me just run through the program again we need to enter in our decimal value that we got previously, just copied and pasted that there and now let's try and enter in this text value that we got and you'll see that the string length has come back okay so it made it went through that check alright um, but whenever it gets to the string n compare it's not getting the correct value and it's actually telling us that the correct value that it's looking for is 7759 uh, and this is the value that we have so why don't, you just, why don't we just take a copy of this string instead and we'll run through this again Oh, first we need to do our square root again so I'm just going to copy that and let's paste that in and let's try and enter in the string that they're looking for we paste that in and although we've entered in the correct string it's compared it to this string here which they look the same right there but whenever it's doing that our strings changed a bit so we now have 7661287 which is not correct um, essentially this is down to an overflow so the value is not going to fit inside a 64-bit variable, the number, a decimal number which we saw as well here as on uh, ASCII to X. If we have a look at the code from here we have, so we know that we want to try and get this to match and this will get, get, get us to the final question. If the string comparison comes back and says that it didn't match, which for us it didn't, we're in a while loop here, so it's going to go down to the bottom and then it's going to go through this loop right here. So we can see here it's actually going to check if the, each of the values is between 0 and 9, so it has to be decimal values. And then we have a second question function here, which is doing some stuff as well. So we need to try and work out what, what's going on here. And this is the bit that I really struggled with. So a good idea if you're doing stuff like this in Geodra is to go and try and rename some of these variables to try and make it make a little bit more sense. You might change the param to user input. We might want to change the loop counter just to depend on what you're used to seeing loops as. I'm going to change that to i. Uh, we have our local 38 here. This is the correct password. So we could say correct part one and do the same here 
part two, part three, we have our string length. So we can update that and say that it's the pass length. And we can basically keep going through in this fashion. Some of them we have to be a little bit careful about. For example, this IVAR2 is going to be the result of the string compare. So we might say here, um, correct. And then if it's zero, it's correct. If it's one, it's incorrect. But if we do that, you'll see it also modifies these down here because that's essentially used as a temporary variable. So uh, you could just leave that as it is. You could change it to something else if you're used to seeing, if you're used to using like a temp variable as your placeholder. Uh, but really, our, the important part is this function down here. There's not too much happening in this second question function. So you could, you know, what I actually did here was take some of this code over to initially. If we take some of this code here and copy it to, uh, let's open up Codium. paste that in and you could go through here and we know that the second question function is taken in this user input why don't we just go back to just so we can keep this all on one screen we could take this here and say instead of calling second question function we'll call that function and we'll pass in the same parameters so you can see here param1 and param2 that would actually be this one right here, and then this one right here would be the param2. And that means we can just get rid of that line altogether. You could take away some of these things, the int conversions, just to try and make it a bit cleaner, so it, um, it's a bit more readable. And then similarly, you have some things here like plus, minus, 0x30, so you might want to just change that to minus. Um, we could do the same sort of thing around here get rid of that plus, uh, etc. You might also want to convert these from hex to decimal if you're used to seeing them more like that. Um, and you could go through in that fashion. Uh, I was having some problems even after decoding this. I decoded this quite, or um, created some pseudocode for this uh, quite a bit simpler than what we have here, but still uh, we're struggling to identify how to solve it. Essentially what we know here is that it's taking the user input but it's also taking our user input plus one. So it's taking the first character and then it's using the second character in our in, in our input to update the character. So each character that we put in our input is going to affect the, the next character if that makes sense. Um, so I didn't actually get past this part of the question. It was a teammate who solved this, uh, who identified the correct string to enter here. Um, they used IDA Pro, which they found a little bit easier to recreate the code in Python. So you can have a look at the IDA Pro code here. We have our uh, second question function. You can see in here we've got that second question function. To me, it's still not particularly um, easy to read or understand, but um, let's go and have a look at how this was turned into some Python code. Uh, again, this was a teammate who did this. I've just renamed some variables to make it a little bit clearer. Let's go and take a look. So we have a crack.py file here. We know that the value we need this to equal is this value right here because that's the string comparison that's being done. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a 7 and we're just going to try and brute force this so we get the rest of our characters built up. And uh, that's exactly what's happening here. So we're going through the loops. We have our current character and the next character. And then this uh, condition here is basically just running through what we have in uh, IDA Pro. So if we if we execute this, we can run python crack.py. It comes back with this value here, and it's telling us that this value is what we need to enter in order to uh, is what we need to enter here in order to produce this target value. So let's go and try it. Let's do our um, alien math. Let's put in our first value, which was the random value. 
let's grab our cracked value that we need to put in here for the second part and that gets us to the final question. So you can see that the string comparison went through and there was no issues. And the last question then, let's go to our gear drawer again. If we go to our final question, here there's not too much happening. So it's basically just taking an input and this is where our buffer overflow is. So there's no conditions or anything that we need to meet here. What we want to do is we want to force this to jump to our print flag function, which there's nowhere that this is actually called. If we have a look at show references to, we'll see that it's not called anywhere in a program. Uh, so what we need to do, let me go back to the third qu final question. So we need to overflow the buffer here. So it's taking uh, an input from us. It's not checking whether the input that we're going to provide is going to fit into the variable. And we want to make sure that we overwrite the return address so whenever it gets down to this return instead of returning to the function which called it it's going to return to this function which we're going to provide or not that function the print flag function which we're going to provide the address of so you could provide the address you can go in here and just look for the address we could open up um, let's open up gdb actually open up gdb pwn debug and in here we could have a look at info functions we could see that this uh, let me make this a little bit clearer. We could see that the print flag function is 4014 FB and that's the that's where we want to jump to. We could even test this out locally. So if we go run locally, go control and C and just say jump to 0x. Oh, jump to star 0x. That jumps to that function, but obviously we don't have the flag locally, so we're not going to be able to control the execution in GDB whenever we're testing this remotely. Um, but what we need to do now is identify how many bytes do we need to write here in order to... Uh, where's the final question? How many bytes do we need to write here to overflow the buffer and actually overwrite this return address? So let's calculate that offset in GDB. If we go back and I'm going to run this, I'm going to put in the correct value for the first part. I'm going to put in the correct value for the second part. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit Control and C to pause it. I'm going to generate a cyclic pattern of 100 bytes. And I'm going to copy that. I'm going to continue the execution. I'm going to paste in those bytes. And we've crashed the program. So now we want to find out what made it crash. Where were the where did the bytes that we entered end up? And you can see right here that although we don't have the address here in the RIP, we have the these first four bytes are going to be the bytes which would end up in the in the RIP if it was a valid address. So now we can try and identify where those those are. So we'll do cyclic dash L to look them up, paste that in, and we'll see that it's 24 bytes. So we need to write 24 bytes and then the address of the print flag function and that should give us the buffer overflow and it does so let me open up the code that we uh, have to do that we'll open up solve.py and this is the usual template that I use for pwn challenges let me just talk through this a little bit before we jump down into the exploit code essentially we provide our binary file name here and this is just going to take care of making sure that any payloads we set up will use the correct format so that it's going to find out the architecture, the bits, the operating system, etc. This is going to set our login levels. We can change this from warning to info to debug depending on how much info we want to see. And here is just our starting function. So to make it quite easy to swap between running the program locally, running it with GDB, and running it remotely, we just have this helper function here. And then we have a script that we can set up. So I was actually trying to debug this previously. You can see I set a breakpoint at the second question function. And I was trying to step through with GDB to try and see if it was any easier than manually going through that uh, that code. But it, it really wasn't for me anyway. Um, so with that out of the way, let's have a look at the actual code here. We start the program. It's going to ask us what's the square root. And we know that the square root is this value right here. It's going to ask us the second question. And we've just calculated that. We could actually go and just take this code here and paste this into our solve script to make it all, all in one. But I've just copied that over. And then we identified already that our offset was 24 bytes. We did that in GDB. So now we can just say we want to create a payload and at 24 bytes in, we want to inject the address of the print flag function, which we don't have to actually put the print flag function. We could go and copy and paste the actual address. 
but um, since Pwn Tools has access to our binary, it's able to go and find out what functions are there and what addresses uh, they resolve to. And that's it. So it's going to ask us the final question, and we're going to provide the payload as an answer. And then we're just going to go into interactive mode and see if we've got a shell. In this case, it's actually just printing out the flag. So we could just set this up just to read and print the flag, but um, this will be fine. Let's go and try it. So if we run python solve.py, you can see because we have debug mode on, it's given us plenty of information. Let me actually just show you if we go back and set that to info. And run it again, we get a lot less information. But if you want to see what's going back and forward between the server, we can change that to debug. I'm going to change that back. And now, because we've got this handy template, which is going to allow us to swap between GDB and local and remote very easily, all we have to do to go and test this remotely is go and grab the server address and port number. And then we can just run the exact same command, Python solve, but we'll put in remote put in the server and the port and then run that and we'll get back our flag and that's been the seesaw qualifying round of the limited challenges that we managed to solve hope you've enjoyed the video any questions comments leave them down below thanks